The Southampton Theory Astrophysics and Gravity Research Centre, or STAG, brings together three research groups with world-leading expertise in fundamental physics and astronomy. STAG seeks to engage public interest in their exciting and important discoveries in particle physics, astrophysics and gravitation. At the opening event, STAG PhD research students discuss their work with visitors. So understanding this interaction is really important to understanding the structure of the universe, how things interact. Astronomy is two things. It's first the uh, um, most fundamental science, but it's also the greatest environmental science. Indeed, everyone throughout history has stared up at the sky, interpreted it in their own way. So it's part of everyone's environment, all cultures throughout all history. And in fact, it's uh, one of the oldest sciences. It's the oldest science except perhaps for medicine, and I always tell my medical friends it's the first to do more good than harm. <laughs> um, and I think if we think of scientific cosmology and astronomy now, there are really four things we're trying to do. Uh, first, sim simply exploring, to see what's out there. But that's the first step to doing uh, what we try to do if we are professionals in the subject, try and make sense of what we see in terms of known physics and perhaps needing to evoke some new physics. And we want really to also understand how our complex cosmos emerged, how from some simple beginnings about which we now have some evidence, the universe evolved into the complex cosmos we see around us and of which we are a part. And we would like to understand this at as deep a level as we possibly can. And astronomers have discovered a huge range of objects of all kinds. Uh, uh, stars have been known for a long time, obviously, um, but we have discovered black holes and many other objects in the menagerie, as it were, and this has been made possible by new techniques. And these new techniques allow us to bring into focus an entirely new set of problems. Well, I'm going to start by going back 300 years to uh, this man, um, Isaac Newton. And he, of course, was probably the greatest scientist of the millennium, but of course, a most unpleasant man. Uh, solitary and reclusive when young, uh, vain and vindictive in his old age. Um, unlike Darwin, incidentally, he was a rather nice man. Um, but uh, Newton, of course, uh, was famous for many things, uh, but I just want to highlight one thing he did. This indicates he must have thought about space travel. This is an illustration from the English version of his uh, great book, The Principia. You can see what it shows. It shows a cannonball being fired from a mountaintop, and if it's fired fast enough, then its tragedy curves downwards, no more steeply than the Earth curves away underneath it. And this, I think, is still the neatest way to explain pedagogically the concept of orbital flight. Well, Newton calculated that to go into circular orbit, the cannonball has to be fired at 18,000 miles an hour, far beyond, of course, what could be done by the cannon in the uh, 17th century. And of course, as uh, probably everyone knows, it wasn't until 1957 uh, that the first object went into space, uh, the Russian Sputnik followed two years later by a dog, and two years after the dog by uh, Yuri Gagarin. And just an anecdote, which the older people here may remember, um, Yuri Gagarin uh, came to uh, London after his flight um, to 1961. He was mobbed by enthusiastic crowds. And the then Prime Minister, Harold Millen, said it would have been twice as bad if they'd sent the dog. <laughs> and, uh, he's probably right. <laughs> well. Things proceeded very fast because only a few years after the first man in space, uh, we had this iconic picture showing the Earth's fragile biosphere contrasting with the uh, uh, sterile uh, moonscape. A moonscape on which, of course, Neil Armstrong placed his first small step in 1969. 
and I treasure this picture signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts who went to the moon, uh, and uh, it was a really heroic enterprise. Um, Neil Armstrong didn't sign this, but I did meet him. In fact, I once gave a lecture where he was sitting in the front row uh, in Philadelphia, and it was a great honor. Um, he was apparently taking notes, but he may have been doing the crossword. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, this was a great achievement. It was motivated, of course, by uh, superpower rivalry to get uh, for the Americans to uh, get a lead over the Russians. And they invested hugely in this. Had they kept up that level of investment, then there'd be footprints on Mars by now. But they didn't. They scaled back. And in fact, uh, manned space flights scaled back a lot. And since 1972, when the last man returned from the moon, uh, people have been no further than in low Earth orbit, many of them in the International Space Station, shown here. It was a long time ago. Um, uh, some of us here are old enough to remember it, but to young people here in the audience, uh, it's ancient history. You know the Americans landed people on the moon. You know the Egyptians built pyramids. But these both seem ancient history motivated by rather strange national goals of prestige, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, even though manned space flight has, uh, uh, has languished, unmanned probes have been crucial. Of course, we depend technologically on unmanned uh, um, satellites for sat-nav, um, environmental monitoring, and communications. And science has benefited hugely from telescopes in space going up above the blurring and absorptive effects of the Earth's atmosphere. But also, unmanned probes have been to the major bodies of our solar system, sending up pictures of varied and distinctive worlds. So I'm going to show you a little uh, um, tour of the solar system. Um, on the way to Mars, if you look back from about five million miles, you see this picture showing the Earth and the Moon with the uh, sun coming from the right-hand side, as you can see. And then here's a picture of Mars, the red planet. Here are some pictures taken by uh, a European a probe, Mars Express, of features on the surface of Mars. This is a gorge several miles deep. And, of course, you may have read about uh, this uh, uh, vehicle called Curiosity that was launched uh, by NASA uh, last August and is trundling around the surface of Mars doing geological um, measurements. It landed on the edge of this big crater within the ellipse in the top left over there. And it's going to be trundling around for about 10 years. And one thing it's going to do is to climb up the uh, mountain in the middle of the crater, which is in fact several kilometers high, quite a major feature. This is one of the views that Curiosity has sent back of the edge of the crater, and you can see geological strata. Uh, it won't do everything a geolog geologist with his hammer could do, but it will do a great deal. So Mars, of course, has been the focus of many uh, attempts, landers and orbiters. Looking further ahead, here's Jupiter. And here are its four major moons, discovered first by uh, Galileo, of course. And they're very different. Io is a sulfurous and volcanic. On the other hand, Europa is covered in ice and there may be an ocean underneath it. This is a picture of a close-up of the ice. It's rather remarkable. Going further ahead, here's Saturn. In this picture, the rings are seen edge on. Here's a especially nice picture of Saturn. This shows an eclipse of the sun by Saturn. The American Cassini spacecraft was at this stage beyond Saturn at such a distance that Saturn just covered the image of the sun, leaving nonetheless the rings exposed to sunlight. And you can't quite see it, but that dot shows the Earth, very small viewed from this great distance. Another interesting thing that was done around Saturn was a probe of Titan, one of the giant moons of Saturn. The American probe Cassini launched from its cargo bay, as it were, a smaller probe called Huygens, 
designed and built by European astro astronomers and space scientists. And it was supposed to do this. It was supposed to go to Titan and land by parachute on the surface about which very little was known. And this was a great achievement in robotics because it's not being controlled from Earth. Remember, it takes seven hours for a radio signal to get to Saturn and back. So this thing was on its own for two weeks before it landed. And it did its stuff. Uh, the left and the center show pictures on the way down. The right shows where it landed. Now, there are lots more pictures now of the surface of Titan. And you can see here, it's got rivers and a little lake. It looks rather nice, actually. But the temperature is minus 160 degrees centigrade. And these rivers are liquid methane and ethane. So it's a very alien world indeed. One thing we all want to know is, will people follow these probes? I'm fairly confident that in the coming decades, robotic probes will send back details of all the major bodies in our solar system. And perhaps robotic fabricators will build big structures in space, maybe even mining the asteroids to get the material. But whether humans will go, I don't know. This is a digression from uh, what's supposed to be quite a serious talk, but uh, uh, I think it's unlikely that there will be uh, a follow-up to the Apollo program. The Chinese, of course, could send someone to Mars if they wanted to, and if they want to have a prestige program, they've got to head straight for Mars, because to go back to the moon would not make sense for the Chinese, surely, because if they want to assert parity with the United States, to do something which the Americans did 50 years earlier is not a very sensible way to do it. So they've got to go to Mars if they want to. If they don't, then I think the future of manned spaceflight lies with cut-price, high-risk, privately-funded schemes. Because as robots get better, the practical need to send people into space gets weaker and weaker. But there are, as you may have read, uh, various private uh, schemes being talked about. Uh, Elon Musk, the guy who also does the Tesla cars, he has uh, um, built rockets and he has launched things into orbit. He's docked with a space station. He'll be sending people up into low Earth orbit. And the more ambitious projects, there's a project to send people, paying customers, round the backside of the moon, going further from Earth than any humans have yet been, not landing, but just going around the back and coming back. It'll take about five days. I'm told they've sold a ticket for the second flight, but not for the first flight. And that may tell you something. <laughs> There's also even talk about sending uh, people uh, to Mars. And one can go around the backside of Mars and come back. Dennis Tito, one of the uh, astronauts who paid to go into space station, is promoting this. Um, uh, and it's quite feasible, ballistically, to have a, a trajectory that goes around the backside of Mars and comes back. It would take 500 days, and according to Dennis Tito, the ideal crew uh, is a stable, middle-aged couple, um, uh, old enough that they don't care about radiation damage, which would be a big <laughs> problem for that. Mm -hmm. And the other idea is um, uh, a uh, one-way trip, that you land on Mars, but that's it, one-way ticket, you don't come back. <laughs> The volunteers from that. I mean, I, I, I told them I'd go when I was a bit older, but not yet. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Well, that's for manned space flights, uh, which I think uh, um, we would all uh, support and cheer on, um, but we've got to accept that it's high risk. And I think, incidentally, to talk about space tourism is a big mistake, because uh, that implies it's routine, and the first crash will then be a trauma, rather like when the American shuttle had its two failures out of 135 launches. Each of those was a trauma because they presented it as safe. Had they said it's all very dangerous, then people would have expected these accidents. And I think uh, we've got to present manned space flight funded by private entrepreneurs as space adventure, not space tourism. Well, one thing people always ask is, is there any life in any of these places I've shown you? on Mars, under the ice of Europa, anywhere else. Well, there may be. The prospects aren't very encouraging. There was some discouraging news from uh, uh, Curiosity just last week. Uh, but uh, no one expects any very interesting life. But 
if we want that, then we've got to go much further afield, far beyond the reach of any probe we can now envisage and think about the realm of the stars. And one of the most exciting things that's happened uh, in astronomy recently has been the realization that most stars have retinues of planets orbiting them, just as the sun has the familiar planets, including the Earth. And I want to say a bit about this subject. It's one of the most rapidly developing areas. And it's a very good subject for young people. In fact, uh, um, the theorists here will know Professor David Gross, who runs the um, Institute of Santa Barbara, which is an international center. And he gauges the liveliness of a, of a scientific field by its inverse correlation with the average age of the people who participate in his workshops. <laughs> and by that uh, criterion, uh, exosolar planets is the top subject, developing very fast, lots of young people into it. Um, uh, I did ask him what the, uh, uh, the worst uh, topic was, and uh, it is turbulence theory. Difficult and intractable problems where most people have given up. Um, well, the evidence for these planets is indirect. With one or two exceptions, the planets have been seen directly. What's been seen is the effect of the planets on the parent star. And the effects that have been studied are of two kinds. The first is indicated here. It's based on noting that the star and the planet are both orbiting around the center of mass, what's called the barycenter. The planet goes around in its big orbit. The star, being heavier, goes around in a much smaller orbit. The dumbbell are very unequal masses. But it's possible by careful spectroscopy to measure the small motions of the star. Here's an example of this being done, um, where um, there's a sine wave indicating a circular orbit. And by this uh, method, one can infer, of course, the mass of the planet and its orbital period and the eccentricity of its orbit. And motions down to about a meter per second can be now routinely measured. And that's a very small displacement of a spectral line, um, about uh, one part in 300 million. Very impressive data, but that's, be, that's been done. And several hundred uh, planets have been found. This is a rather out of date list with the sort of telephone numbers of all these planets um, and uh, uh, what their orbitals have in major axes. But there are, there are many hundreds of, of planets seen this way. But it's not possible to detect an Earth-like planet by this technique because the Earth induces a motion of only a few centimeters per second in the sun. And that's too small a velocity to be detected by this, uh, by, by this uh, uh, Doppler method. But there is another method, equally simple in principle, which is to look for transits in the cases when the orbital plane of the planet is along our line of sight. It's obvious that if a planet moves across the face of a star, it blocks out a fraction of the star's light. So if you measure the star's brightness very precisely, you will see a dip. And then the next time the planet comes round, you'll see the same dip. And in the case, say, of an Earth-like planet going round a sun-like star, the dip would be about one part in 10,000, because the radius of the Earth is about 1% of the radius of the star, so the area is one part in 10 to the fourth. And the Kepler spacecraft spent three years pointing at a field of stars about seven degrees across and measuring the brightness of 150,000 stars in that field with a precision of one part in 100,000 over and over again, once or twice an hour for each star, looking for objects of this kind. And it found many hundreds of cases. And of course, remember, it only finds the uh, one or two percent of cases when uh, we are looking in the orbital plane. So uh, this indicates that there are many uh, Earth-like planets um, uh, orbiting stars. And of course, uh, um, people then say, could there be life on those? Well, there again, we don't know. Um, we don't know how likely it is, because we don't know how likely it is that life gets started. And of course, even less do we know how likely it is that uh, simple life, once it gets started, evolves into a complex biosphere, like here on Earth. 
but everyone knows that there are these projects like the SETI uh, search looking for intelligent life. Um, and uh, good luck to them. I think it's, uh, uh, it, it's possible that this, this will happen. Um, but uh, I, I'm not holding my breath. Of course, there are people who uh, think that they know already that it's intelligent life. There are people who say they've been abducted or visited by the aliens. Um, I say to such people um, two things. Uh, first, um, do you really think that if the aliens had made the tremendous effort to traverse into stellar distances to get here, would they just make a few corn circles, meet a few well-known cranks and go away again? <laughs> Doesn't seem likely. And the second thing I say is that they should write to each other and not to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've mentioned so far that we can only infer these planets indirectly. We really like to see them. This is just an uh, art, artist impression movie of what we'd like to, to see. And to actually detect the light from a planet um, is much hard, harder than what's been done so far. It needs very big telescopes. Um, to indicate the problem, uh, suppose that uh, you were an alien looking from, say, 50 light years at the solar system. You'd see the sun as an ordinary star. You'd see the Earth as a pale blue dot in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, very close to the, to, the, to the star, our sun, in the sky, and billions of times fainter. But if you could observe that pale blue dot, the light from it, you could learn quite a bit about it, because the shade of blue would be different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the land mass of Asia, or land mass of Asia was facing you. So you could infer that there were continents and oceans, the length of the day, and something about the seasons, and maybe even something about the atmosphere. And uh, it's, it's going to be possible um, to uh, uh, get spectroscopic data on planets orbiting uh, nearby stars using the next generation of telescopes by uh, looking at the spectrum of the star and looking for this tiny change when a planet comes in front of it or goes behind it. And here, the next generation telescope will help a lot. Uh, this is a, a sketch of the telescope which the European Southern Observatory hopes to build. It's got a rather unimaginative name, the Extremely Large Telescope. And it is planned to be extremely large, 39 metres in diameter. That's uh, probably about uh, at least twice the width of this room. Uh, not just one bit of glass, of course, but several hundred piece mosaics. And a telescope like this, well instrumented, will be able to detect the spectroscopic signatures of Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. And so uh, in, say, 15 years or so, uh, we'll be doing this sort of thing and uh, <coughs> learning something about these other stars. But will there be life on them? We don't know. The origin of life is something that's uh, a big challenge to the most earthbound biologists. We know how uh, life evolved. Darwin's told us that. But the transition from non-living to living, the first uh, uh, production of uh, um, replicating, metabolizing entities is still a mystery. And when we understood, understand that, we have a better feel for how likely it is that it's widespread and where best to look. Incidentally, um, no one is surprised that planetary systems are widespread. Because we have good evidence that when a star forms, it forms from a dusty cloud of gas which contracts. And if it's got even a little bit of angular momentum, as it contracts, it'll spin up, as in this cartoon, and form a protostar surrounded by a dusty disk containing the angular momentum. And this is the way in which we think uh, uh, our solar system formed, and this is a generic process. We see protostars, and we think that it's therefore not surprising that uh, planets uh, should be common. Here's Newton again. Uh, Newton, of course, famously showed that the planets move in elliptical orbits, but in his optics, he said he didn't understand why the planets all move in the same direction, in more or less the same plane, what we call the ecliptic, whereas comets move in all directions. He thought this was providence or something. Now, we understand that. I've just explained the reason why we're not surprised. So we've traced back the causal chain. 
And I think the message of cosmology is to keep pushing back the causal chain. At some stage, we always have to say things are as they are because they were as they were, but we can push things back further. And I want to now discuss how we can uh, say something about the formation of atoms and of stars and of galaxies, pushing things back further uh, than understanding why solar systems have the uh, configurations that they do have. We see stars forming in places like this. This is the Eagle Nebula, 7,000 light years away. And we see stars dying. This is what the sun will look like in about five billion years when it dies. Here's another star dying, another one in a rather messy way. And this, of course, is a famous object, which many of you will know. It's the Crab Nebula, which is the uh, debris from an explosion witnessed and recorded by Chinese astronomers. This is the record of the court astronomer, I guess the astronomer royal for the Chinese court in 1054 AD. And uh, he, uh, he reports that a star flared up for a few weeks brighter than the moon. And he said where in the sky it was, and that is where we now find the Crab Nebula. And something else about this uh, Crab Nebula, in its center, we've known for more than 40 years, uh, there lurks a, a spinning neutron star, a pulsar spinning at about 30 revs per second, pumping energy into the nebula, keeping it bright and blue, and also uh, sending out a, a pulse every time. I mention this because neutron stars are one of the things uh, being, being studied uh, here in Southampton. Another reason that supernova remnants are important is that, as Fred Hoyle was the first person to properly realize, were it not for them, we wouldn't be here. The basic point, which uh, uh, Hoyle elaborated, is that when a massive star, a star weighing, say, 10 or 20 times as much as the sun, ends its life, it's been getting to ends by nuclear fusion, and it's got this sort of onion skin structure where the hotter inner layers have been cooked further up here at the table. So there's carbon and oxygen, then neon and magnesium, etc., and then iron in the center. And then when it's flung out into space, all these elements mix with interstellar gas and then condense back into new generations of stars, like in the Iran Nebula. And so what's going on in our galaxy is this sort of flowchart here. I won't go into this in detail. Pristine material from the Big Bang, which is hydrogen and helium, goes into stars. The heavier stars have short lives. They, they, they blow it out and new stars form. And so all the atoms in us were made in stars which exploded uh, five billion or more years ago. And then that material uh, went into the uh, uh, nebula that contracted to make our solar system. Indeed, probably we contain inside us atoms from many hundreds of different stars coming from all over the Milky Way galaxy. So our galaxy is a kind of ecosystem where stuff is being recycled. If you could get two million light years away from our galaxy and look back on it, it would look like this. This, of course, is Andromeda, the nearest big galaxy to us. It's a spinning disk, viewed obliquely, 100 billion stars orbiting around some central hub, and a big black hole in the center, incidentally. Here's another nearby galaxy, uh, the Whirlpool. And uh, this is a, um, a map showing uh, many thousands of galaxies in two sectors of the sky. Um, and uh, galaxies are grouped together in clusters, but essentially they just spread as far as you can see. Well, particle physicists, of course, um, advance their subject by being able to crash their particles together and see what happens. Astronomers are helpless. They can't do experiments on anything. Um, uh, they can just observe. And also, uh, most things in the universe happen slowly, but not everything. But in the virtual world of a computer, we can speed things up and ask what would happen if two galaxies crashed together. And here is a picture uh, showing an example of this. Two galaxies fall together, and the com computation includes the mutual gravitational pull of all the stars and the dark matter and you get this sort of train wreck, and this will settle down into an amorphous galaxy. 
And I should warn you that the Andromeda galaxy is going to crash into us in about four billion years, four billion years, and then it'll look something like this. It won't actually affect the solar system very much because these stars will still be very widely uh, spread. But we look in the sky, and this is a photograph of a pair of galaxies. And having done simulations like the ones I just showed you, we can infer that what's happening here is that two galaxies have got close and one is pulling out a tidal stream on the other. And if we came back in about 100 million years, these two would have merged. And we can do calculations for different assumptions. We can put in different amounts of stars and gas and, and a third constituent of dark matter and see which matches best what we, what we see. And one of the most important things that we've learned over the recent decades, was first speculated 80 years ago, but the evidence is much more recent, is that galaxies contain not just stars and gas made of ordinary atoms, baryons, but they contain about five or six times as much stuff in the form of some so-called dark particles, particles which uh, have no electric charge, don't emit and absorb light, but they swarm around and contribute importantly to the gravitational effect. I don't have time to say much about this, but uh, I've listed here four uh, techniques. One is galaxy rotation curves. If you measure the um, spe orbital speed of the outer parts of a galaxy, you find that the uh, stars and gas are orbiting so fast that if there was no gravitational pull holding them in, apart from the gas and stars you see, they'd fly apart, so as much as an extra mass. A second line of evidence comes from X-ray astronomers who can look at a cluster of galaxies and they can see uh, and that they can uh, uh, detect Brehm Starling emission from very hot gas and they can infer how deep your potential well is to confine the gas at that temperature. And again, they infer that there has to be um, more material than we see. And the other uh, technique is to uh, see how fast galaxies are moving around in clusters and uh, again, infer how much extra mass must be there. I won't go into those three, but I will mention the fourth method, which is one that I'm sure Einstein would have liked very much. In this picture are the galaxies in a cluster about a billion light years away. The fainter objects are galaxies much further away still. And what you see are these some sort of streaky objects here. And what's happening is that the gravitational pull of the cluster is deflecting the light so you're looking at the background galaxies as though through a poorly figured converging lens. So the pattern becomes sort of streaky. And by analyzing lots of images more carefully, you can infer, just by straightforward optics, what the mass and mass distribution in the cluster of galaxies is. And there again, you find that there must be more matter than you see in, this, in the stars and gas, and there must be dark matter. And the outcome of a whole lot of evidence is that um, we have um, dark matter, which is several times more than, than ordinary atoms, which are called baryons. Uh, but uh, in both cases, the uh, density averaged over the universe is less than the so-called cosmological critical density. There's a standard density that cosmologists talk about, which is a density such that um, the kinetic energy of the expanding universe is balanced by gravity. A universe that just has enough energy to get to infinity if nothing else operates. And so uh, um, all these densities are well below the critical density. They won't cause the universe to recollapse, uh, but there's more dark matter than ordinary baryons. One way we can test our theories of galaxies is that uh, we can do something which geologists can't do. We can actually look at the past. We can look at galaxies a billion light years, two billion light years, three billion light years away, and therefore see what the population of galaxies looked like in the past. And we can look very far away. This is a picture showing a small patch of sky, just two or three arc minutes across. It would take a hundred patches like this to cover the full moon in the sky. With a small telescope, this field would look completely blank. But with a big telescope, you see these hundreds of smudges. Each of them is a galaxy, many of them fully the equal of our Milky Way. But many of them, so far away, that they're being seen when they're very young, and the light's taken more than 10 billion years to get to us. 
and we can study them and uh, uh, see if they've got as big a proportion of uh, um, carbon and oxygen, et cetera, as nearby galaxies and things like that. Now, we'd like to look still further back than I've showed you, because uh, uh, it, it, uh, if the universe expanded from a hot, dense state, then the further out we look, the further right on this picture, <clears throat> the further back we're looking. And we'd like to look back to the first galaxies, the first stars, even to the so-called dark ages uh, before any stars had formed. And how can we do this? I want to just mention uh, three uh, techniques. One is <clears throat> to look for very small galaxies, even further away than the ones I showed, <clears throat> by using a big telescope, but also using nature as a telescope, as was done in this picture, which I showed you earlier. If you understand the, um, the optics of this gravitational lens, then you can calculate that there are some places in the sky where a background object will be magnified by 10 or 20. And so if you look in those particular places, you might be able to see a very distant galaxy, which without the aid of gra gravity's telescope, you would never see. And by this method, there have been claims to have found galaxies further away than that quasar. A second way of looking further is to study a very remarkable class of events called gamma ray bursts. I've talked about supernovae, which are objects when uh, um, the core of a big star collapses to a neutron star or a black hole, producing a huge amount of energy, which then percolates out through the envelope of the star and gives a light curve that rises and falls in a few weeks. But in gamma ray bursts, the star is spinning, so the sudden energy release doesn't diffuse out. It forces a way out along the rotation axis. That's the easy way out. And so we have um, the picture like this, that uh, um, the energy is released in a few seconds, and instead of diffusing out, it finds the easy way out along the axis. And so energy, far more than the sun put out in its 10 billion year history, comes out in a few seconds. Moreover, it comes out beamed in a small, in a small cone angle. And if you're in this cone angle, you're zapped by this intense beam of gamma radiation um, and other radiation, uh, and it's so bright, it's about a, um, uh, several thousand times brighter than even than the quasar, that this could be detected in principle even out to very large redshifts. The SWIFT satellite, which has looked for gamma ray bursts, has found many of these, and there's a definite gamma ray burst at a redshift of 8.2, and a possible one of 9, but in principle, if there are any gamma ray bursts at a redshift of 15, they would also be visible. There's a third way in which we can study the very early universe, by looking at the, the gas. If we look back, and we're looking back further towards the right, then uh, the gas um, is almost completely ionized for all objects back to register of six. You can infer that because you don't see much neutral hydrogen absorption in the spectrum of objects. But we think that what happened is that the gas was neutral um, at, uh, at very early times, and it gradually got ionized when the first galaxies lit up. So the um, proportion of the volume which is ionized decreases as you look back in time. And if we had a telescope which could detect neutral hydrogen, then we could do a sort of tomography on the universe, because neutral hydrogen has a spectral line of 21 centimeters. And of course, if we look at different wavelengths, we see different redshifts, and so we see different shells around us. And there's a proposed telescope called the Square Kilometer Array, which is going to do, among other things, just this. It's going to be built half in South Africa and half in this uh, convenient underpopulated Ireland in the Southern Hemisphere, shown on the left there. And uh, this is going to have uh, the ability to study the line from neutral hydrogen um, at, uh, at, at very great dis distances and uh, 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 do tomography doing different depths. And I'll just show you the picture, the sort of thing it will find. This is the highest redshift, where it's nearly all neutral. And then as you come in, you start seeing the ionized patches. And it'll do, do that sort of thing. 
This is just a picture of a time chart, probably familiar to many of you, about uh, how we believe our universe evolved according to the Big Bang picture. And we can trace things back with a good deal of confidence to one second. That's when the temperature is about 1 MeV, 10 to the 10th degrees, and that's when hydrogen and helium react, and we have good evidence uh, from the proportions of hydrogen and deuterium as to what went on there. So we can, with confidence, trace things back to about one second. We can probably even go back further than that, probably back to about a nanosecond. That's the time when the average energy of the particles was of order the energy produced in the LHC. But going back further than that, then we lose our foothold in experiment, because every particle in the first tiny fraction of a second would have more energy uh, than the um, uh, LHC can produce. The challenge is to try and understand better uh, this early history. First, let me say a bit more about how galaxies evolve. The early universe was very smooth. The present universe is, of course, very inhomogeneous. Hot and cold, dense and rarefied. And when people are first told this, they say, doesn't it violate the second law of thermodynamics, which normally says that structure washes out, to have an idea that the universe started off very smooth and ended up very, uh, very lumpy? Well, the answer is no, because of the effect of gravity. Gravity has rather perverse thermodynamic properties. If we have an expanding universe and a slightly overdense region, it lags behind more and more as it expands. Density contrasts grow, and it'll condense out. The picture I'm going to show you now is a movie where the expansion of the universe is subtracted out, the fluctuations early on, and you see them develop. This is speeded up by 10 to 17 from real time. And you see that it starts off smooth, but overdense regions lag behind, and we end up with uh, um, the structures, and, and then it can be compared rather like the distribution of galaxies I showed you earlier. Here's another picture which shows the development of structure, and this one <coughs> considers separately the dark matter, shown in blue, and the uh, um, baryons, which light up, shown in red. And this shows the formation of a galaxy. When high-density regions form, the gas in them condenses, and then they merge, and this will eventually uh, turn into a galaxy. Movies of this kind portray how galaxies emerged, many powers of 10 faster than it actually happened. And each galaxy that forms is an arena within which stars, planets, and perhaps life can emerge. There's one important point. In these calculations, the initial conditions can't be completely smooth, there are fluctuations. And the fluctuations put into those calculations aren't arbitrary, they're fed in from observations. They're fed in from observations made most recently by the Planck satellite, which studied the microwave background over the whole sky with immense precision. It's not completely uniform, the temperature varies, but the, the scale is such that the maximum minimum temperatures are spread by only one part in 100,000. But from this data, you can tell how lumpy the early universe was on a range of scales. And that's the data which is fed into those calculations I showed you. And it's a great triumph of the theory that there is a match. This di diagram shows the um, density contrast, the root mean square density fluctuations as a function of scale. And the solid blue curve shows what the theory predicts. A lumpy universe on small scales. And the various uh, lines and bars show evidence about the density contrast on the scale of clusters of galaxies, galaxies and smaller scales. And it's a remarkable achievement that we can explain the structures of galaxies and the way, and the way they're clustered um, by the action of gravity enhancing density contrast, as in those movies I showed you, starting off with fluctuations in the early universe, which we can also measure. This is a wonderful consistency check, which suggests we're on the right lines. But 
What we'd really like to do next, and this is where uh, we need uh, more input from the uh, particle physicists, is to understand why the universe is expanding the way it is and where it has and where these fluctuations came from. And I'm going to um, come back to, to that in a minute. But let's first make a list of what are the prerequisites for universe. If you want to make a universe, what are the requirements to end up with an interesting one? And I'm going to go through about seven things. The first thing you need is gravity. But gravity is very weak. And the weaker gravity is the better. This is my favorite pedagogical slide. I won't have time to go into it, but it shows uh, radius along the bottom and mass upwards. And it's a very extended log scale, as you can see. Um, it goes up uh, 76 powers of 10. You see a proton at the bottom. You see a line of slope 3 and a log log plot for nuclear densities. And you see uh, atomic densities there. And you see um, people asteroids, the Earth, and planets. And you see the black hole line. And because gravity is so weak, a black hole the size of a proton weighs 10 to 38 times as much as a proton. And you can see that the action of stars, where, uh, where gravity becomes important, is the three halves power of that number. Now, I show this picture to illustrate that if gravity wasn't so weak, if this large number wasn't so large, we'd still get basically the same picture. You'd still have stars as gravitationally bound fusion reactors, but there'd be fewer powers of 10 between the cosmos and the micro scale. So gravity has to be very weak, and the weaker it is, the better. We also need some departure from thermodynamic equilibrium in the universe. If everything stayed like a, inside of a star, we wouldn't have anything. We also need, and this is very important, matter-antimatter asymmetry, because if the early universe was completely symmetric between matter and antimatter, then as it cooled down, the matter and antimatter would all annihilate, and we'd have radiation, maybe dark matter, but no atoms. So there must be some bias, so there's more matter than antimatter. Also, we need non-trivial chemistry. We need some tuning between the two important forces of the micro world. The uh, nuclear force that holds atomic nuclei together, and the electric force, which tries to disrupt them. And this has to be tuned in such a way that we get a periodic table. If the only stable element was hydrogen, then chemistry is very dull. There'd be no in interesting structure. We also need to have stars. And uh, that requires um, atoms and gravity, etc. And second generation stars, because they're the ones that have processed material and can have planets around them. And we need a tuned cosmic expansion rate, not too slow, that it we collapse too soon, nor too, uh, too fast so that galaxies can't pull themselves together against the disruptive force. And importantly, we need non-zero fluctuations in the early universe. Well, in our universe, these conditions are plainly fulfilled. But they're fulfilled because of physics, which is very uncertain at the very early stages. I mentioned that we had good confidence in extrapolating back to when the universe was at about 50 GeV. That's about an, uh, uh, um, a nanosecond. At that stage, everything we see in the universe would have been squeezed down to the size of a solar system. But many people believe that in order to understand key features of the universe, like why it's expanding the way it is, why it contains its particular ingredients, we've got to go back far, far further. 1016 GeV. Now, I put in a hazard sign because this is where, uh, with respect to my colleagues here, uh, the physics is still very uncertain. And I rather like this cover from a, a, a science magazine there. And the important point is that uh, the key features of the universe, the fluctuations and everything else, were, it is generally thought, imprinted when the entire observable universe we can now see was squeezed down, not to the size of the solar system, but to literally the size of a tennis ball at 10 to 16 GeV. Well, I would say no more about that. That's something where there are many experts here uh, who know more than I do. 
just a comment about the future of the universe. Here we had a surprise a few years ago. There were traditionally in the textbooks three different forms for the future of the universe. This shows time upwards and the scale of the universe sideways. So um, the universe is expanding now, but it may stop expanding, recollapse to big crunch. It may expand in a decelerating way, or it may expand and accelerate. And the big surprise was that it, what we weren't in the middle version, which is what most people guessed, but in the right-hand one, where the expansion is accelerating. There's a network of arguments that imply this, but the best known was that when you look at supernovae at great distances, they're like standard candles, you find that the expansion of the universe, when it was uh, half as old as it is now, um, instead of being, um, uh, being faster, is actually slower. And this is a big puzzle. Another thing which uh, uh, raises great interest is how big is the universe? Is it a lot bigger than what we actually see? What we actually see is big enough, obviously, but it could be that there's a lot more beyond. I think even the most conservative astronomers believe there's quite a bit beyond because uh, it's rather like if you're in the middle of the ocean, there's a horizon around you, and you don't think that the ocean stops just beyond your horizon. It goes on. Likewise, there's a horizon around us set by how far light's been able to get since the Big Bang. But that's just artificial. And most astronomers would suspect, I think, that the universe goes on thousands of times further. They'd suspect that because if we look as far as we can in that direction, in that direction, conditions don't differ by more than one part in 100,000. And that therefore suggests that if we are part of some finite structure, it's very big and the gradient across it is very gentle. And it could go on much, much further still, so that all combinatory options are repeated, and there could be avatars of us sitting in another lecture room far away and avoiding all the mistakes we made. You know, we don't know. That could happen. But that's not all. I've talked so far about the aftermath of our Big Bang. Um, and uh, uh, the other exciting possibility is our Big Bang is not the only one. There's an idea called eternal inflation which is symbolized in a sort of cartoon here. The bottom right shows what I've just mentioned, our horizon and a lot of material before, beyond that. But this could be just sort of one bubble, just one small domain in some infinite ensemble. And uh, th this is an idea which was first proposed by a Russian uh, astronomer called Andrei Linde. Um, and uh, uh, it's just a possibility we won't know whether that's true or not until we understand the physics at 10 to the 16 GeV, until we have a proper unified model. And, in fact, a sort of important decision tree for 21st century physics is to uh, see which uh, part of this decision tree is the correct one. Is there one Big Bang? Rather many? If there are many, the second question. Do they all cool down governed by the same laws? Or do they cool down ending up governed by different laws? Different strengths of gravity, different microphysics, etc. If the, there is a variety which is suspected by many string theorists, then what we call the fundamental constants will be just sort of bylaws governing our cosmic patch. And on this very grand scale, uh, there will be a variety in uh, electron masses and uh, strengths of forces, etc. And, of course, if this is the case, then we are not in a typical member of the ensemble. We're in a typical member of the subset in which complexity leading to life could emerge. We're not in a sterile universe where those eight conditions I listed aren't satisfied. This is called by some people anthropic reasoning. But other people foam at the mouth at that uh, uh, term, so I won't use it anymore. But I would like to just uh, mention that, uh, in a sense, we are going through a transition rather like what happened before Newton in the time of Kepler. Uh, Kepler uh, believed that the orbits of the planets were fundamental things related by the platonic solids. Now, we now don't believe that. We think that the Earth's orbit is something messy, determined by a lot of historical accidents, 
Um, and all we can say about it is it's, it's in the range of distance and eccentricity that allows life to exist. And we may have a similar transition to make about the Big Bang parameters. People used to think that we were in a simple Big Bang where uh, um, the universe had the critical density and uh, lambda, the force that caused the acceleration, was zero. But now it could be that there are different Big Bangs with different parameters and we're just in a typical member of the subset. So there's a, a sort of parallelism between what's happening now on the scale of the Big Bang and what happened between Kepler's time and now on the scale of planets. Well, of course, um, it depends on um, uh, the issue of whether there are many Big Bangs or not. And uh, uh, the, the, the many ideas, um, one idea is that there are several three-dimensional spaces embedded in a four-dimensional space, but the most popular is uh, eternal inflation. And uh, as to how seriously we take the multiverse, um, I think we should be entirely open-minded about it. One shouldn't be dogmatic, pro or against. In fact, I was on a panel a few years ago um, where someone in the audience asked, how much would you bet on the multiverse? I said, well, uh, in the scale, would you bet your goldfish or your dog or yourself? I was about at the dog level. And then Andre Linde on the panel said, uh, well, he'd spent 25 years of his life, 25 years of his life working on this. So he would bet his life on it, you know, took it very seriously. And then Stephen Weinberg, the great physicist also on the panel, he said he would happily bet Martin Rees's dog and Andre Linde's life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, just to finish this lecture, a word about the long-range future of the universe. The fundamental uncertainty is about this energy which is causing the acceleration. The simplest idea is it's what Einstein called lambda. It's a force latent in empty space, which you won't understand until we understand the uh, grain granularity of, of empty space on a tiny scale, which string theorists are trying to find. Um, uh, if that is constant, uh, then we can give a long-range forecast. And the long-range forecast um, is that um, the galaxies are going to not merely move apart from each other, but accelerate away. And so we'll have almost an eternity ahead, an ever colder and ever emptier cosmos, because uh, uh, our galaxy and Andromeda are bound together. They will eventually merge and make one big galaxy. But everything else will eventually disappear beyond the horizon. It's accelerating away. So in the far future, um, there will be nothing to be seen apart from the uh, remnants of uh, our galaxy and Andromeda. And of course, stars will fade away, protons may decay, dark matter particles may annihilate, occasional flashes will occur when black holes evaporate, and then I suppose silence. And that's perhaps a good note on which to finish this lecture, except I should make one remark which perhaps is a uh, uh, rather tasteless since we're talking about uh, to a theoretical group and STAG is a theoretical institute, but I think it's only fair for us theorists to say that at least 95% of the progress that's been made in astronomy and cosmology is due to um, technology and observations. Theory by itself, armchair theory doesn't get us very far. We're no wiser than Aristotle, and the reason we've got further than Aristotle is because of the efforts, largely, of uh, experimenters and uh, technologists. So with that, may I wish Stag every success in his future and conclude. Thank you very much.